Well, let's bring in Chris Doyle. He's a Middle East commentator and the director of the Council for Arabic British Learning. He joins us now live from London. Uh, Chris, then, so what's, first of all, your expectations for Netanyahu's speech? Could it focus on finding an end to the war or calling on the US simply for more aid to continue its war in Gaza? Thank you very much. I'm actually from the Council for Arab-British Understanding, and I think it's not just Israelis and Palestinians looking at this. I think the rest of the world are watching it. And it's an extraordinary context, frankly, because you've got a situation where an Israeli prime minister, you would think normally when foreign leaders address both houses of Congress, it's an extraordinary honor. And the United States is conferring on a particular leader something that very few should get and, and rarely do. Yet this is, in this situation, one where Netanyahu arrives even more a polarizing figure than ever before. This will be his fourth time doing this. That's more than anybody else. That's more than Winston Churchill got. And in fact, Israel now would have had more leaders addressing both houses than any other country at, at 10. That is extraordinary. And he will be addressing this with not really at the request of President Biden. Just in the past, in his previous speeches, he was not invited by President Obama or Clinton. Uh, he's not totally welcome in Washington. So he's going there without the support also of his own electorate. Three quarters of Israelis don't want him there. He's divisive in the United States. So I think actually, to be honest, the expectations are very low because there's very little he's going to say that is going to bring people together. I don't think there's much he's going to say that's going to bring home hope for some lasting peace and the end of the genocide that is being perpetrated by Israel in, in Gaza. And I think it will only add fuel to the flames. Would you say this is his fourth address? He's not particularly welcome. Um, we also know that, of course, um, Israeli-Americans, um, young students, they're protesting on Capitol Hill against him. But there was a quote in that um, report by our correspondent um, where he was described as a political fox. Um, and that's the thing about him. This is really about him and his political survival, isn't it? It's always about Bibi, it's about Netanyahu. And he is a supreme political operator. He certainly is way ahead of all his contemporaries in Israeli politics. That's why, you know, he became the youngest ever leader in 1996 of Israel. And that's when he first addressed Congress. Imagine that had been so long ago. Uh, and he's still there. He is the longest serving Israeli prime minister, but not because of any strategic brilliance or ethical uh, standing or genius, but he is an operator. He knows how to pull the heartstrings. He will give a performance. Be assured there will be humor, there will be anger, there will be all the tricks of the oratorical trade that he specializes in. But in terms of substance, what is he going to do? He will thank the United States for its ongoing support, as he indeed should, given that the United States has provided this extraordinary pipeline of weapons to Israel uninterrupted throughout the last 10 months, nearly 300 days. So for certain he should do that. But it will be the underlying script that we'll all be watching out for. Is there going to be any implicit criticism of those who have tried to stop that arms uh, process, that pipeline of those who think that there should be a ceasefire deal? I mean, I think that we'll be looking for all of those sorts of signs rather than reading the speech at face value. And do you think um, President Biden um, has no choice but to give um, Prime Minister Netanyahu um, his demands for more weapons? Well, President Biden is, uh, you know, recovering from illness in the moment. We understand that he should be meeting Netanyahu on Thursday. And of course he has a choice. He could say, I'm afraid I'm not going to do it. But I don't think that's going to happen. I think that although President Biden, like President Obama and, and, and indeed President Clinton, have no real love for Netanyahu, Biden does have a very strong link to Israel. And he clearly believes that it's important to provide those weapons to Israel come what may. So I think there may be some disagreements between the two, but they're not going to be 
that overt. But it is extraordinary also, I should point out, that this will be actually the first time that Netanyahu has met Biden as president in the White House. I mean, Netanyahu has been in office in this particular term since January 22, uh, uh, 3, and he hasn't been. So that's quite extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, you know, to, to think that, that he has been snubbed in that way. And then the main challenger who might replace Biden, Donald Trump, hasn't spoken to him for three and a half years because of a bitterness over the fact that Netanyahu did not s support Donald Trump in claiming that the election had been stolen from him back in 2020. So, you know, all of this is um, really fairly polarizing, divisive politics. I'm not sure what good is going to come from it. Indeed. And there's also a potential uh, President Harris, who's not in the capital, to meet in today as well. Uh, Chris Doyle, um, thank you for your analysis. Um, it's been fascinating talking to you.